Keith here. In this presentation, I'll look at features of mangrove forests using Darwin Hub as an example and looking at some issues related to the marine systems model. So down the bottom here, I've got four of the commonest tropical mangrove species, Adicenia, and this is a species that's found widely around Australia and is one of only two that is commonly found in temperate regions. Um, it tends to occur widely throughout the forest, so it can be at the back, middle or down towards the water. The next one, Cereops, is a shorter tree but often grows in clumps of a hundred and forms the main tidal flat part of the mangrove. The third rhizophora is found along creek banks predominantly and closer down to the um, waterline. Lastly, Sonoratia in Darwin Harbour is just found along the open areas right at the front of the mangroves and we'll see that in a moment. As you can see from the quote, there's quite a large number of mangrove species, more than many people expect. Now here is a map drawn or created by uh, Brocklehurst and Ed Meadies based on both aerial photography and ground truthing, where they mapped out some of the main assemblages in the mangrove forest. And I've done a blow up of that part of the harbour, which is Charles Darwin National Park, so that little um, area all on its own there. Now, the very light blue you see along the edge is the Sonoradia belt. And right behind it, the dark reddy brown is Rhizophora, and that is behind Sonoradia when it's on the open coast and is also lining many of those creek banks. And you'll see the creeks wind around a lot and have many branches coming off them. This creates a great deal of complexity in the forest structure. And in the blow up you can see that it's not really mangrove zones so much as mangrove patches which are determined by the topography and also the soil and in some cases the input of fresh water to the system. Now, inhabiting the forest, there's quite a diverse group of invertebrates and vertebrates. Um, the commonest are the crabs, and the two main groups are grapsids and fiddler crabs. The grapsids are herbivores or carnivores or omnivores, so they feed on material they can grab with the claws and chew up. The fiddler crabs feed on detrital material, so they're sifting through the mud and the sand to extract organic material. There's a few species of mollusks. Some of these crawl along the trees, feeding on whatever they can find there in the way of um, algae. Some crawl along the bottom, feeding on the mud, and some are predators. And lastly, I put a photograph of a mangrove insect there, and ants in particular are a common element of the f fauna that grows along the ground. They're also important in herbivory of mangroves, so eating mangrove leaves in particular, and pollinating many of the flowers. And the study by Coupland was looking at those things, insect herbivory, and also pollination and how they interacted with the mangrove pollination cycle. There's a surprisingly large vertebrate fauna in the mangroves. We would expect to see birds, and down the bottom I've got a little um, honey eater. And those kind of birds move through the mangroves, feeding predominantly on insects, but during the flowering season they'll also come through and take nectar. And then next I've got a wading bird, a heron, and those kinds of um, birds are in the mangroves and will be feeding more in the creek areas and in um, open areas where they might be looking for worms or s snails or shells um, or crabs, things of that nature. You can see there's a surprisingly large number of mammals that get into the mangroves as well, 13. The introduced ones are of course 
the cat and the rat, but there are also possums and a range of other species. And then finally, bats. Quite a lot of bats. Some of these are predominantly mangroves, others move through the mangroves um, and into other feeding areas. Um, work by Kristen Metcalf showed that turtles actually moved into the low shore mangroves at high tide and fed on mangrove seedlings. And she did an experiment with cages, showing that cages down there low shore stopped the turtles coming in and some of the seedlings survived, which would have otherwise been eaten. Finally, Julie Martin's study was specifically done to find what fish were utilising the mangroves. Um, fishing is or amateur fishing is very popular recreation around Australia, particularly in the top end. And of course there's also commercial fisheries, so it's important to know which species are using mangroves, both for feeding activities and also as nursery areas. And you see there's quite a range there. Some of those, such as mudskippers and little gobies, actually remain in the mangroves at low tide, sheltering in burrows or in pools, but the others move in with the tide and move out as it retreats. Uh, Julie also found sharks coming in as well. Now, some early ideas about mangroves. These actually formed in the early 1930s, 1940s, uh, particularly in America and with ecologists looking at areas like Florida. And there mangroves were taught to be thought to be part of a vegetation succession. So mangroves came in, colonized the shoreline, led to more sediment being deposited, and the ground becoming higher. That became unsuitable for the first established mangroves, so they moved further down shore and other mangroves came in behind them until eventually a terrestrial forest formed. Now in America, in their swamp, swamps, they only have a few species of mangroves, so it was basically a succession between um, Rhizophora and Avicennia and one or two other species. From other studies, particularly some geomorphological work, and more recently GIS and remote sensing, we now know that much of the time mangroves will respond to changes in the coast. So if the coast is building up, mangroves will colonise where suitable and if it's eroding they will retreat. In fact a lot of mangrove colonisation in New South Wales occurred on sandbars that were built up from sediment being washed down from upstream. Another idea from the Americas was that material wash from mudflats, from mangrove forests and mudflats, moved into nearby bays and estuarine areas where it fed the food chain. Pioneering work done by scientists at James Cook University and the Australian Institute of Marine Science, and then picked up by people elsewhere, has shown that in the Indo-West Pacific region, most of the mangrove material stays where it falls. It's in fact consumed by crabs and some is taken by some of those large snails. So it depends where you are, what the food chains are going to work like. Finally, there's the idea that the mangrove forests of Darwin Harbour are relatively undisturbed. Now from the point of view of human development that's true. There's about 20,000 hectares and only about 2% have been disturbed uh, by clearing or any similar sort of activity. However they are disturbed by natural events and in tropical areas the main one of those is of course cyclones. So parts of the mangrove forests around Darwin were severely damaged or destroyed by Cyclone Tracy. Um, I'm not aware of any effects on those forests by more recent cyclones which have been relatively mild by the time they've got to Darwin. As well as that large scale disturbance there can also be smaller scale disturbance from things such as lightning strike which can come hit a tree and basically kill a circular block of trees around them. Now 
a fair amount of research has now been done in mangroves in Darwin Harbour and in other places. And you can read through the list there as I talk. Some of this is what you would call basic science, such as looking at the reproductive biology. Other is more applied, so considering responses to sea level rise. Uh, or polychaete distributions, that's small marine worms, in response to basically contamination from nutrients, that's sewage, and metals. Now over on the side, to the right there, you can see some of these studies being done. Up the top, you can see several of the um, baskets or nets we use for sampling leaf litter fall. So they're left there for a month, and then at the end of a month, the person doing the study will walk in, empty each of those into a plastic bag to be taken away and perhaps sorted and weighed in the laboratory. Down the bottom, um, that's a PhD student from CDU from some time ago, and she's actually got a little fence there, which is being used to monitor litter consumption. Obviously, it's just leave the area there, things will wash away. So that's keeping things where they are, but the crab burrows are still in there, so the crabs can still get at material, and crabs can actually burrow under the side of that to get in. So most of the work that I'm talking about here will come from these sorts of field studies. Okay, now here's an infrared map of the distribution of mangroves in Darwin Harbour. You can see all the green there is the mangrove area. And the labels there, E1, E3, and so on, are labels, uh, labels for permanent study sites established by the um, various NT government um, monitoring bodies. So it's just there is DIPE, but the NT government has a habit of rearranging the public service quite quickly. Um, so these were originally set up by people working in land planning and environment in association with Kristen Metcalf. So uh, I'm going to talk later about Kristen's litter sampling work and that was done at these sites as was work done looking at mangrove biomass. So I showed earlier that big map done by Brocklehurst and Admedes where they had identified the different mangrove assemblages. And here are the eight most important ones running from, uh, at, and they're not in order, from um, shoreline backwards. So shoreline rhizophora is really the second zone you would see after leaving the sea, usually. In front of that would be the Sonoradia woodland. Uh, and then you get tidal creek in around the creek areas and the mid tidal flat, high tidal flat is the middle part and the hinterland is at the back. Now the first thing I want to call it, focus on is the area column. You'll see a listing there for 19,000 hectares in total identified here. And the main area is the mid tidal flat dominated by that species I referred to earlier, Theriops nearly 8,000 hectares. After that, Tidal Creek, and that's the band of Rhizophora, predominantly, but also Avicennia, that lines the Tidal Creeks. Now you might be puzzled at how the Tidal Creek and just the edge of the Tidal Creek can account for so much area. And this is because, as I said earlier, the creeks wind around a lot and also split off branches. So there's quite a lot of that Tidal Creek habitat. And then you can see the third in the listing there with about one and a half thousand hectares is the hinterland. So that's the fringe of mangroves at the back between the mangrove forest and terrestrial forest. And that's patchy, so it's in some places and not in other places. And it tends to depend on the local topography um, and other things such as water supply. The others, you can see account for less than a thousand hectares, so a relatively small percentage. Now I mentioned earlier the leaf litter collection bags. 
And so the second column, the mean annual rate, tons per hectare per year, is productivity or litterful. So, and it's anything that falls into those bags. So it includes leaves, flowers, propagules, and smaller branches. And here you'll see there's a different order. And in fact, the three most productive are those that are at the front of the forest. So the Sonoradia woodland and the shoreline rhizophora, followed by the hinterland at the back. Tidal Creek rhizophora, you can see there, is also quite a productive habitat. It's only a little behind the hinterland. What this means is when we look at overall productivity, we need to take into account the rate for that particular assemblage and also the area it occupies. And when we do that, the most productive habitat or most productive assemblage turns out to be those tidal creeks, 50,000 tonnes per year, followed by the mid-tidal flat. Now the mid-tidal flat, as you can see, is actually the least productive in terms of um, tonnes per hectare per year, but it is the largest. So it comes in number two overall. And then finally, the hinterland comes in at number three across all of the columns. Add it all up, and it comes to a rather amazing 125,000 tonnes of material produced by the mangrove forests of Darwin Harbour every year. That's an enormous amount and it makes these forests as productive as some of the most productive tropical rainforests in the world. For this reason, people are now starting to look at something called blue carbon. And you might want to do a web search or a Google search on blue carbon. But it refers to productivity from mangrove forests and also from seagrass beds and including other types of similar habitats, so salt marsh. Now the 125,000 hectares there actually is a bit on the high side because um, as Kristen's advisor, I forgot to take into account the effect that there's gaps in the canopy and that will reduce that figure there. It doesn't reduce it by a great deal so the overall productivity is still around 100,000 tonnes per year. But there is a sizable amount of canopy gap. And you'll see some evidence of that a little bit later on. So it brings that figure down. Now that work has been published by Metcalf and a couple of other people uh, with important calculations being done by Don Franklin. Okay. Now, I said productivity predominantly stays there, and one of the reasons for that is these crabs. Now, these are actually the same species. I recently learned this species comes in two colour forms. You can see there with the yellow claws and up top right with the red claws. And also the lighting in these photographs is different, which also contributes to making these look like two different species when in fact they're not. Um, up top left, you can see a shot of Cereops taggle propagules as they're growing. As some people will be aware, many mangrove species have propagules or seeds that start to grow while they're still attached to the tree and then they fall down later. Um, and those propagules are a favourite food for these crabs. But you can see by bottom left that they'll also quite happily take leaves. Bottom right, a uh, result from Sandra Salgado Kent, where she looked at the litter fall in an area and the amount of processing by crabs. And you can see there's a pretty straight relationship. It does depend a bit on where you are. So the more litter falls, the more the crabs consume. Not especially surprising result there. When I took students for a little look at the mangroves from the edge last week, uh, I said, what's different in there from 
usual forest, they said, oh, no understory and no leaf litter. In mangroves, it's very dark, so seedlings have difficulty establishing, particularly as they tend to get eaten by crabs, and the crabs come up and take the leaf litter away down their burrows. Okay, some significant points from recent research in mangroves in Darwin Harbour and also in Australia and Southeast Asia. First, one thing we find important is that we need to do studies in a few sites of the same kind of habitat. So we just don't do one tidal bank or tidal creek and one tidal flat site. We need to look at a few because we find differences from one site to another site, even though we're in the same kind of mangrove habitat. And that may be due to differences in other things in the area. So we often find considerable variation in the rate of ecological processes. So how much litter falls, how quickly it's consumed, and these sorts of things. And that's for the same type of assemblage, but in different locations. Now we can get some consistent patterns. I've shown you the sizable difference in terms of litter fall. But if we go to two sites and look at litter fall there, two sites of the same kind, we'll still get some fairly substantial differences. And we've got to take that into account when we're doing the research work and also if we're planning the management of these mangroves. We can't assume that one bit of hinterland is going to be just the same as another bit of hinterland. They'll be similar. Um, and then when it comes to interactions among species, the important thing is it goes both ways. Often botanists will tend to think the plants are the most important part, and zoologists will tend to think the animals are the most important part. It's both. So the mangroves provide important resources and actually create that particular kind of habitat. If you take the mangroves away, you get a different kind of environment. And in fact, the types of animals, particularly the crabs under the mangrove canopy, tend to be different to the ones that are in open areas. Under the canopy, we tend to get grapsids, and in the more open areas, we tend to get fiddlers. Um, but also, the animals affect the mangroves. Insects and bats and birds are pollinators. So they're an important part of the mangrove reproductive cycle. Um, insects, snails, crabs and some other animals are also consumers of mangrove material, either when it's on the tree or in the ground. And then lastly, crabs, of course, dig burrows. And they dig quite big burrows and quite a lot of them. So they can substantially alter the soil. So we need to think about those sorts of things. And um, in some parts of Southeast Asia where they've tried to rehabilitate some mangrove areas, they've had problems because of the activities of crabs coming in and taking away the seedlings they're trying to establish. Okay, one of the um, important roles of mangroves is generally said to be their protective role, they shelter the coastline and keep the sediment together. This is quotes from a study after the 2004 tsunami, which says, basically, it's complicated. So you can read through there. But in some places, the mangroves do seem to have that up protective effect. In other places, they don't just do anything. And in others, they may actually make things worse. Um, and there's now been several studies of different places before and after that tsunami, and they come to different conclusions. So it's really a matter of, again, yes, but depends where you are. Now this is a really nice diagram for thinking about different kinds of stressful and disturbing events. Um, on the lower axis, we've got the length of time for which the hazard persists. So you can see, for example, a tsunami is less than a day. It's a, it comes through, it's incredibly destructive, but it's for a few, a few hours. Right up at the other end, we've got 
sea level variations which take place over many years. And then in the intermediate areas, you an oil spill which might last for a few days before the oil dissipates or is cleaned up. Um, pollution events which might last for a few years. And things like erosion which are somewhat intermediate between pollution and longer term things. Now the side axis is the impact per unit time. You can think of it as the amount of damage. So right up the top there you've got the tsunami. It comes in, doesn't hang around for a lot, but it is incredibly destructive. Storm surges and sort storm waves and surges associated with things like cyclones last a bit longer and are still very destructive but not as bad as tsunamis and so on. You can go through the locations of the other things. The things that tend to be around for longer tend to have less impact per unit time but of course that impact can accumulate so it's not saying that they are necessarily less harmful it's just that it may take longer for any effects to be seen. Now I think this is a very useful kind of diagram to think about when you're thinking about that um, Oz Coast thing because I've said you're looking for changes over a period of 50 to 100 years so it's longer term things but over that period of time we might have some shorter term things that do cause some destruction or change. Now here's an example of one agent of change. Now in the class I can flip quickly between this and the next. It won't work here because it's going too slowly but keep your eye on the area near the point, that patch of mangroves near the point or the hilly area there. Uh, it's right in the top middle part of the screen. That's 82 and this is 2007 and you can see it's now a marina estate development. There's still mangroves on the sides of it and it hasn't removed a large amount of mangroves if I just go back. Okay, you can see it's removed some. Um, and the, uh, there's other development um, down towards the bottom left as well. Um, and lots of the mangrove area there has been replaced with various kinds of harbours and port structures. Uh, this incidentally is not the main harbour, uh, main port in Darwin Harbour. So that is of course development and development is still the largest threat to mangroves in most places. Um, Here's results from a study which I was actually involved in th through a student looking at how the mangrove forests of Ludmilla Creek and Rapid Creek responded after being cleared. And I've referred to some of this on the LearnLine site. So the hurricane affected area was Ludmilla Creek, the triangle was Rapid Creek, and as I showed you on the LearnLine site, the Rapid Creek mangroves were essentially bulldozed flat, so that curve starts at zero. The Ludmilla Creek cyclones were knocked over by cyclone. <laughs> the Ludmilla Creek mangroves were knocked over by cyclone Tracy, and it didn't reset them to zero. What it did was take out much of the most of the adult trees, but because the tide was part way in, seedlings and shrubs survived. So immediately after the cyclone's gone, there's still a fair amount of canopy there. It's very low to the ground uh, and only one or at most one and a half or two meters high, but it's there. And you can see a very rapid rate of recovery at those mangroves until it plateaus off at about 85% after about 15 years. And that's basically because the young trees were there and they just had to grow and reproduce. So it could re-establish very quickly. For the triangles, Rapid Creek, the initial recovery was quite slow. 
because the seeds and propagules had to come in from somewhere else. There was a little bit of mangrove left upstream, but it was only a small amount. Once there'd been some establishment, then it took off again. And um, by a bit, about the same time, 15 years, it nearly caught up to where the cyclone damaged one had. And then since then, they persist at about 85 to 90 percent canopy cover and that's when I referred to earlier when I said they were I'm going to show you some evidence where there was gaps this shows you that you get to a certain amount of cover and then it really doesn't change much and this very quickly is uh, Lord Miller Creek in 1988 and then we go about 10 years later and keep your eye on the areas that are white with blue dots so good ones to watch are towards the top left and you'll see they shrink so those gaps were canopy gaps that were left by cyclone tracy so between 1975 and 1988 a lot of it filled in and then over the remaining time more of those canopy gaps have got filled in. Of course, one thing that we look at in the unit is sea level rise, uh, in, at least in the marine system section. And this is from the IPCC, their last assessment report. The next one is coming out and it's being released bit by bit. Uh, and this is actual sea level rise, it's not predicted. Um, so you can see there are some places where there's relatively little change, so that's the dark blue areas. So there might be a, a decrease or no change at all, and then up, uh, otherwise increased. And uh, this is in millimetres per year. So if we look around Australia, we can see some places where there's slower rates of rise and some places where there's greater rates of rise. Uh, in tropical Australia, again, varies. There are parts of tropical Australia which have lower rates and parts which have higher rates. But this is not the whole picture. Um, first of all, when we, if we just talk about average sea level rise, that's really not very meaningful because, as you can see here, it does vary quite substantially from location to location. And second, you've also got to take into account the movement of the land itself because parts of land are rising and other parts are sinking. So that can slow the rate of rise or increase it. So again, the average is not a useful figure. We need to know what's happening at a location. This is a Woodruff's study looking at potential effects of sea level rise on mangroves in Darwin Harbour at Creek H. Top is the current situation. I have redrawn his diagrams and put in some colours. The second one is with sea level rise only and the third one is making some assumptions about the redistribution of sediment following sea level rise. Now if you look at the two bars on the top right, HMTFTC refer to hinterland margin, tidal flat and tidal creek. Now tidal flat is normally the largest so Creek H is a little bit unusual in this respect. Then underneath that L is Lumnitra, C is Cereops and um, the hinterland margin they're drawing in here um, is including parts of that main tidal flat area as well by the look of it. Um, X is Xylocarpus, C is Cereops again, and then R is Rhizophora, and at the far right we get B for Rugiria, R for Rhizophora, and S for Sonoratia. Now you can go and look at the middle graph at about how things change, but I'm going to skip straight down to the bottom where, where he assumes some redistribution. And there's three bars there. The top one is just copied from the top diagram, the current situation, back when the study was done, and the next one underneath that is showing potential changes. And you see it's not a lot. 
hinterland margin drops down a little, tidal flat drops down a little, and tidal creek expands a little. And then you'd expect more tidal creek if you raise the sea level up a little bit. Again, what happens depends on the situation you're looking at. So let's go to the next one um, and look here. This is a study down there um, done by some people from Real looking at change in coastal mangroves in a few places outside Darwin Harbour but near Darwin. So the big blue rectangular thing um, halfway between Liania and the top of the graph is the Liania sewage treatment plant. And then there's a couple of large coastal creeks here. Now they divided the um, vegetation up as you can see there. So you can look at the mangroves, the dark green, you can see where that is at the time they did this. It was 2004. And then the lower right little dots is where they um, basically took point samples looking at coastal intertidal areas and upper tidal areas and that's important for the next maps or the next diagrams. So for the three swamp areas, mangrove swamp areas, going from left to right, so Lianya through to Mikit, and then looking at the coast, the intertidal area and the upper tidal area. And if we start down the bottom, they're plotting the percentage of that area that is mangrove, or I should say the proportion. So if you look at Lianya upper, we see it started at essentially zero and has climbed to a quite significant 20% by 2005. And you can see for all of the locations, there's increased mangrove in the upper. Go to the middle and again you'll see an increasing trend in three of those locations. Down the front, on the coast, there's been an overall loss. So there's been erosion there with the loss of habitat. Now the big dip that occurs in 1975 is presumably due to cyclone Tracy. Now from my understanding most of these places were out of the direct path so some of this may come through from storm surge as well. So there we go. The red sentence is the important one. There's been a lot of mangrove habit, a uh, lot of mangroves at the front but a substantially increased amount at the back to the point where there's more mangrove um, that at any previous time that they looked at. Um, and let's go over to the next diagram. This is from one of the readings looking at potential responses to sea level rise of mangroves. So the top one is no sea level rise. Next one is it drops. And the next two are the ones that are important from the point of view of rise. And this relates back to Creek H. And I'll go back to that graphic in just a moment. So really the contrast between the C and D is that the mangroves in D are right up against um, obstructions that prevent further migration. So there'll be loss at the front and the mangroves cannot migrate further. Let's try and go back. You can see in Creek H the, hint, the left edge of the hinterland margin doesn't move. And if you look at the elevation diagram, you can see why that is. There's a steep rise in the land. So those mangroves don't have anywhere further back to go. So they have to adapt or adjust to... Okay, so we're nearly at the end here. Mangroves are an important coastal resource for a few reasons. One is they're a great source of nutrient fixing, nitrogen fixing, producing material which feeds into the nitrogen and carbon cycles in coastal habitats. Second, 
they are potentially an area that protects coastlines from erosion and from the effects of storms and cyclones. And third, they're important areas with their own unique community of species of plants, animals and micro microorganisms. And then finally, their nursery areas for um, juvenile fish and also crustaceans, things such as mud crabs. We've seen that they can recover from disturbance, but it depends on the nature of disturbance, the scale of the disturbance, and also what other sorts of things are happening around them. Likewise, what's happening around them affects how they respond to coastal changes. And these sorts of things are going to be affected also by topography and hydrology. So hydrology is the movement of the water. So it's not a simple system. It's quite a complicated system, but parts of what are likely to happen can be predicted based on what we know now. But we've got to take into account that a patch of mangroves is not the same as another patch of mangroves and things such as the local geology, the local landform and freshwater input will also be important.